Good morning. I uh, should warn you, uh, the reading that I have is in a slightly different version of what you will find in the Q Bible. The first reading this morning is from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, and you can find it on page 547 in the Q Bible. When I saw what I was to read for this morning, I was tempted to burst into sorrow. Pete Seeger fans and those of a certain age will know what I mean. Ecclesiastes is a book that in many ways is an examination of secular wisdom and knowledge from ancient times. That is what we've been able to discern from under the sun. So in this way, the book has remained practical and up-to-date through the ages. But you know me, I go a little deeper into this, and it's always fun to do that. The passage we will read acknowledges our faith for meaning in a world we can control. This is a world of change, from seasons to aging bodies. Yet God is unchanging. We live with daily paradoxes. Our reading reminds us about it. Whose world this is? Who truly is in charge? Why it is good to be humble? Why we give God praise? And why? Given the gifts we have, it's important to rejoice and to be good. So let us listen now for the word of God. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plan and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to lay up, a time to mourn, and a time to die, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to serve, and a time to give up, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to care, and a time to mourn. A time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What does the world say, gain from his prayer? I have seen the burden God has laid on me. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they work. That everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his prayer. This is the gift of God. And so ends our reading the word of the Lord. This morning, um, our second reading comes from John's Revelation that often preached from this book of the Bible, 
and it's not usually a topic of conversation in many churches because of John's imagery and the ways in which he weaves divisions together. But we should remember that, that this is really a book of hope written to the early church that was under persecution. And so I'm going to be reading from the 21st chapter. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. He also said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Let us pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our hope, and our salvation. Amen. So here we are, approaching New Year's Day, a time of new beginnings, a day for making and often breaking New Year's resolutions, a day of starting over, starting again, making a change. We're in the season of Christmas, one that ends for many on Christmas Day, for, but for us as Christians, Christmas is the day, the season of new beginnings, a time when we celebrate anew the blessings received from a God that was born into the world as we are all born and yet lived as none of us has ever lived. This is a season, a time when we rethink, renew, resolve to make the kinds of changes that make a difference in our lives and the lives of others. New Year's resolutions can be a way to reprioritize, reprioritize those things that are really important in our lives. A man once decided only to make New Year's resolutions that he knew he could keep. So he resolved to gain weight, to stop exercising, to read less, to watch more television, to procrastinate more, to quit giving money and time to charity, and to not date any member of the cast of The Real Housewives of You Fill in the Book. And to never make New Year's resolutions again. Of course, he was successful on all counts, except that he made the same resolution the following year. Now, the truth is, we probably need fewer resolutions and perhaps a few more revolutions in our lives. Resolutions even when they're made with the best of intentions, can be difficult to keep. When we resolve to change our own behavior through our own power and for our own ends, it's likely that we won't have what it takes to make lasting change. But in reality, we may know that there are things in our lives that we need to do differently. We know that something needs to give. We may truly need to revolt against the past in order to open up space for God to make some new and radical change in our lives. So this morning, I want you to think revolution 
and not resonate him. But New Year's Day is like any other day in a season, like any other season, the writer of Ecclesiastes tells us. And there is a time and a day and a season for everything under heaven. Some seasons are for dancing and rejoicing, and other seasons will be for sadness and mourning, and that is the way that the world works. The seasons come and go. The days come and go. The years come and go. We live through seasons in our calendar years and in our lives, and that is simply the way that it is. The planet has been set in motion. The die has been cast. We play the part that we have been given or the hand that we have been dealt. It is what it is, no more, no less. We are of the 99% or the 1%, and that makes little difference. We are born, we live, we die. And in between, there is a season, a time, for experiencing all of the things of life that we will inevitably experience. Now, when I was young, I heard it said that as you get older, Years pass much more quickly. I'm not sure that I believed it then, but I certainly believe it now. I can remember being a young child looking at my older brothers and sisters and wanting to be older so that I could do more and have more independence. And every year seemed to move so slowly. I wanted to be a teenager, and then when I became a teenager, I wanted more than anything to go away to college. When I got to college, I became eager to graduate and start and start my life. When I got out on my own, I wanted to find the right person and get married. Then I wanted to buy a house, and at every stage of my young life, I was in a rush to get to the next stage. At every stage, the years went faster. I kept thinking that if I could just get to the next stage, that I would be satisfied, that I would experience the fulfillment that had somehow been eluding me, I would arrive. I would be happy. Now, it wasn't that I hadn't experienced happiness along the way. Quite to the contrary, I was blessed to be born into a home where we didn't want for love or material possessions. We weren't wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, but we weren't poor either. And my parents loved each other, and they loved us. Growing up in that home was a good thing. But somehow, somehow I never felt fully satisfied in my life. I've been blessed by the ability and the means to be educated. I've been blessed by having and given and received the love of family and friends. I've been blessed by fulfilling work that provided enough in the way of preacher comfort. But it was never enough. I kept feeling like there was something missing. And I really didn't get what that something was. I had a relationship with God. I was involved in the church. felt good about what I was doing in my life. I kept waiting for that season of fulfillment to arrive. And when it never did, I experienced a crisis. A crisis of confidence. A crisis of faith. Something was missing, and I didn't know what it was. Finally, I did realize what was missing. I really didn't know who I was or who God was calling me to be. I'd spent my life doing all the right things, all of the things that I was supposed to do, but I hadn't come to terms with the work that God had for me to do. I hadn't admitted to myself or to God that the work that God had for me might require that I step out in faith and start over. I didn't realize 
that finding real happiness might require a radical change. I didn't realize that what I needed to experience in my own pers- was my own personal revolution against everything that was holding me back from being and doing what, was, what God was calling me to do and be. I didn't realize that I might have to take things apart before I could put them back together. In Thomas More's book, Meditations, he tells the story of a pilgrim walking along a road. The pilgrim sees the men working on a stone building. You look like a monk, the pilgrim said. I am that, said the monk. Who is that working on the abbey? My monk, I'm the abbot. It's good to see a monastery going up, said the pilgrim. They're tearing it down, said the abbot. What ever for? said the pilgrim. So we can see the sunrise of dawn, said the abbot. Sometimes I think we might need to remove some things from our life so that we can see the beauty that is already there. Sometimes we need to allow God to remove things from our lives that are standing between us and the life that God has for us. Sometimes we need to let God take control of our lives so that we can do and be all that God is calling us to be. God has a plan for your life. Regardless of where you are or think you are going, perhaps you are exactly where God wants you to be. And perhaps you're not. Perhaps you've really been wrestling with this, or perhaps you are just starting to. Wherever you are on your journey, wherever you have been, God promises us to meet us right wherever we are. And don't expect that when God meets you there, that God will leave you there. God needs you. God wants to bring about God's realm of justice and peace. God is inviting you to join the revolution. God says, see, I am making all things new. Everything. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Stop and think about this with me for a moment. What work is God calling this community to participate in right here and right now? What work does God have for you personally to do? Are we all being called to challenge the powers and the principalities, the oppressive power structures present in our world? If the answer is yes, how do we do that? How can we respond to Jesus' call to create the realm of God in the fear and now? God wants us to join in this creating and recreating of a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus called his disciples throughout his ministry to join in bringing about the realm of God, and we are called to do nothing less. And in the end, God tells us through this revelation to John that the realm of God will come down to earth. It will happen in is happening. We can either fight it or we can get on the bus. During the heart of the struggle to end apartheid in South Africa, a worship service was led by the Archbishop Desmond Tutu at St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town. My friend Jim Wallace was there and he loves to tell the story 
of how the people would go there for worship and get energized for the daily struggle that they faced in standing up to the apartheid system. Now, this was at the height of the tensions between blacks and whites, and no one thought it would be over any time soon. One night, Jim was there, and Bishop Tutu was speaking, and the people were dancing joyfully and praising God. The constant reminder was the guards that stood along the perimeter of the church to make sure that the crowd did not get out of hand. At one point in the worship service, um, Archbishop Tutu was standing at the pulpit, looked at them, and he began to smile at them. And he said, We have already won! Join us! Come and join the winning team. As you can imagine, the congregation erupted in joy and in dancing. And they were so welcoming. They wanted the parents to join them. And because we know the end of the story, we know that this truth is right. But at that time, nothing could have seen the farther from the truth. There was no indication that the powers of the South African government were beginning to become the, power, the more powerful forces for freedom and liberation. The Bishop Tutu spoke God's truth to the oppressive powers that seemed impossible to break, trusting that God and not those colleagues would have the final word. This is the promise of John's revelation. Regardless of what the world may look like to you, God has already won the battle. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God has taken the fight to the streets and won. We are invited to join God's team, the team that will win in the end, regardless of what you see in the here and now, regardless of how bad it gets. Our God promises to make all things new. God will win, and we will win indeed. We have already won the battles. Those that are before us, and those that are in the realm of yet to come. Jesus says, I am making all things new. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will not leave you alone. I am with you in the struggle, and we will win. Indeed, we already have. So today, I leave you with this challenge as we head into 2014. What revolutions do you need to make in your own life? What changes does that need to foster? What is God calling you to do and be in the here and now so that together we might all further God's realm? Answering these questions might cause you to make some very real changes. They might cause you to rethink who God is calling you to be and what God is calling you to do. They might mean tearing down some parts of your life that aren't working and building up something new or trying something new. But the God who has called you to it will indeed see you through it. See, Jesus says, I am making you all things, everything new. Amen.